So today's session is about machine learning to Docker. Um, and then we are gonna be understanding why Docker is useful and how uh, Docker is useful for uh, a CD pipeline, right? So uh, I think this is relatively lesser understood by machine learning engineers. Uh, typically people just like to uh, you know, leave an EC2 instance running, but Dockerizing actually is a very key skill because this is super useful whenever you are trying to uh, do a robust deployment. And especially when you're trying to do pipeline building, which is uh, a part of MLOps, Docker is extremely important. So let's get started. So uh, typically, this is the format in which machine learning algorithms are developed, right? So there is, a, you have a, either a Jupyter notebook or you may be you know, writing in some version in an IPython notebook. But if, if these are .ipynb, then um, you know, creating them into something else is relatively harder. So the first thing you should do is if you have a Jupyter notebook, you should first of all create that into .py files, so .python files. And again, uh, several SDs are uh, you know, available for that. So you can use PyCharm, you can use, uh, you know, Spider. I use Spider a lot. And then there is this process of packaging. So packaging the front end. So what typically happens if you just have your machine learning algorithm, how will your client access that? So that's the reason why there's a front end development and front end development can be very easily done using Flask and FastAPI. FastAPI doesn't even re require any you know, index or HTML files. Flask does require that. Then there is Streamlit. There are so many other ways in which you can literally package. And what packaging literally means is you are going to be now exposing a RESTful API. Right? In order to do that, you will always have a get and you will have a post function. So get means you're getting an input from, uh, you know, the, from the customer and post means you're, you're pushing whatever output you got into your you know, final uh, outcome. So in this case, if you think about it, first of all, there is this dot, at the rate app dot root. So this is still Python code. And uh, there is an in, you know, initial rendering of the initial, uh, you know, initial web page. So that's the reason why the, in the index page is in HTML. And then if you have predict, so that means, uh, you know, let's say you have a model dot predict function. If you're trying to post that, or if you're trying to push that to your, to your customers, then that becomes a post function. And this is what it is doing. This is a very simple uh, example in which it is taking, uh, it has CSV file, uh, you know, the ML algorithm is taking, just going through the different CSV files and it's just trying to make a model dot predict. So when you have seen this model dot predict uh, function, but then how do you literally take this outcome and give it to your, uh, give it to your customers. So that's a part of your deployment, right? So that is a that is what this app app dot root can do. And then this is just showing you if, if it is a app, you know, predict predict underscore API, it's just another page or another button that you can create, then it is going to give you the first prediction outcome, right? And the other thing that is important in these front ends, and we will look at uh, another code, is what port is it running? So if you see this particular application is running at port 88. You will see most of these applications that is developed it, it by default it runs at port 8080. Can you change it? Yes. Um, so Flask and Fast, uh, so Flask and Streamlit can also be you know streamed at port 5000. But typically 8080 is preferred because that's the node port that uh, generally you bind your applications in to finally expose it to your customers, right? So your host is 0.0.0, .0 and then in this case, your port is 88. So always be very cautious about what port number you are exposing your, uh, your, your application at. And then finally comes to this, uh, to, to the state called dockerizing. And in dockerizing, what, what essentially you're doing, you're creating a Docker container out of this whole process. So you started with the Python notebook, you created a .py file with all of these uh, you know, bells and whistles in it. And finally, you are putting everything together. It's like gift wrapping, right? So initially you have some raw, you know, raw materials, you, you, you know, package that up into the gift. And finally, Docker container, it is, think, think about it, it's just finally putting it in your gift wrapper. So then you know, the gift box, then that becomes your Docker container that can then run in, at, multiple different, at, at multiple hosts to serve multiple uh, you know, people at, at the same time. So this, the, the, what are the different steps for Dockerizing? Let's review them first. So for Dockerizing, and this is for Docker in, in production environment. Now Docker has also become very popular in, uh, in, the, dev, in the dev environments because uh, you know, there, there was a way in which you could have invoked virtual environments, were, you know, were ENFs, 
But now, Docker is also being used for creating a virtual environment because it has the capability. If you just you know build a Docker image, it will have exactly those you know the same versions of the libraries that you're interested in. So let's you let's say you're interested in Flask, Fast API, Matplotlib, Scikit-Learn, all of them. It will just put everything in one place, and if you run that. Uh, if, if you run that uh, Docker image after that, it'll be as if you are running within this particular virtual environment and you can literally be running your code inside it. So Docker, Dockerizing in dev you know, is, is another way of creating a virtual environment as well. But we are talking in terms of deployment. So that's the reason why it'll always end with a command line and the command line and the you know, port in which you're, you're exposing everything so that uh, you know, the Docker can run by itself, right? So your, your, your raw materials that you need to you know, do this gift wrapping that I just talked to you about. So first of all, you need a Docker file. A Docker file is, is just a, you know, it's just a file and it, it has no you know, extensions or anything. It's just a Docker file and it has certain components that I will be reviewing in a bit. You build the Docker file to get a Docker image. So this is the step number two. And the Docker image then has to be run and then it becomes a Docker container. So always remember, file to build, build to run, right? So you take the file, you build it, you get the Docker image, then you run that, you get the Docker container. And this Docker container, you can put in multiple locations, in multiple pods. That's where you, you know, your Kubernetes orchestration can then take off once you have Docker containers. So, you know, think about them as, as multiple versions of the same algorithm or the same uh, function. Actually, it's application in this case, which is running that you can then uh, ship off to multiple locations so that you can have customers all over the world working with it. All right, now let's look at the steps for the Dockerizing. So let's start with the Docker file and let's try to understand what goes inside a Docker file. So this is a very simple Docker file, uh, I, I will say. So if the first thing that you need to you know, mention is what is the environment? So is it Python? What version of Python? Is it, the, is it the light version of Python? Is it the complete version? Are you putting GPU? So all of that goes in the top command, which is the from command. Then you have the run command. The run command, and you can have multiple run commands. Run commands are essentially all the installs, like think, think about it, all the pip installs or all the app get uh, you know, installs that you're doing. Whenever you start a virtual machine, you actually are starting from scratch, right? It's like having a scratch machine and you're installing all of the you know, apps and, and softwares into it. So the run command is a way of doing the same thing. So you're essentially getting everything in. So copy is again, if, if you're just trying to you know, copy the requirements in, and finally you just do a pip install of all the requirements, right? So ideally, if you have like a laundry list of applications that you require for your machine learning algorithm to run, all of them will go into this file, which is called requirements.txt. And what this run command will do is just, it's gonna to go to that uh, requirements file, it's gonna pick it up, and it's gonna ensure all of that is installed. Right? And then it is just gonna say, which is my working directory? Where is my working files? or you know, this, uh, the, the Flask or Fast API, the application files, where are they housed? So then you just you give it the working directory. And finally, you have to have the command, which is called the Python app.py. So think about it, the, by, the, the, the command, uh, whatever it goes into that bracket, it's actually parsed version of the command that you put in Python in order to run that app.py, right? So every word goes in it separately. So once you have all of these components, you have the bare minimum, in order to now generate a Docker image, right? From it. So a Docker file is a recipe for Docker images. Requirements is um, you know, the file needed. And you can definitely set up you know, different build commands. And this is the you know, Docker, uh, the, the recipe for, for building a Docker image. Now let's say that you have done the build command and you've already built, uh, you know, created a Docker image for yourself. The snapshot of this app is now ready to run. But as soon as you create a Docker image, it's not running by itself. Just creating a Docker image does not mean that you have started the application, right? You have to now run it in order for the, uh, for, for the node board to be exposed in, in order for the application to be exposed to your customers. And I will show you exactly how the process works. So that it, it represents the means of interaction with the you know, ML algorithm. And finally, as soon as you have the run command, like I mentioned, then now you will start seeing a, a Docker container, which will expose this API call and now you can literally do multiple things with it. You know, 
you can run multiple versions of this Docker container on one virtual machine. You can have like 5,000, 10,000 versions of these Docker container that is, uh, you know, servicing all your customers globally. Or you can also work with Kubernetes orchestration so that, you know, if, if one Docker is down, it will automatically uh, create another one. Does, is always Docker required for Kubernetes? Kubernetes can work with other containerizations as well, but Docker is the one preferred. But do you always need to, uh, you know, put after the, the step after Docker? Do you always need to get to Kubernetes? The answer is no. There are some applications that can actually stop at the Docker level. And then there are some applications that require Kubernetes orchestration. The, the pluses of having only Docker is, uh, you know, you can have the same version running multiple number of, of, of you know, times. And if you don't really need to push changes to it, you can just keep running by itself. But uh, the downside of having a Kubernetes orchestration could be because if whenever you're scaling, the system slows down because it's trying to figure out how many people are, are accessing the, the server. And based off of that, it's trying to automatically scale. So create more pods, create more replicas. So it can actually slow the process down. However, Kubernetes is actually the best scalable method in the long run, because once you have a Docker container with Kubernetes orchestration, you will ensure you have to have minimal uh, you know, supervision after that. These containers then can keep running. If for some reasons anyone fails, the Kubernetes orchestration will automatically file, find a replacement. It will roll out different versions if you are doing over the air updates. All of that is possible only if you have Kubernetes orchestration with the Docker. Right? But is it necessary? The answer is no. All right. I hope that helps. So now let's go straight into the uh, demo that I have um, set for you. Let me quickly check chat. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, so uh, I am saying thank you for absolutely I'm here. Can you discuss about the medical imaging in recent healthcare literature and NLP in medical domains? Okay, sure. I can definitely talk about some of the latest trends that I am uh, looking at. Let's complete the, the, the Docker example, and then we will get to this. Okay. All right. So first off, I will share my screen. Right, so here I have actually started. So this is a virtual machine. This is a global, this is a GCP virtual machine that uh, I am gonna be using. So in this virtual machine, I, the, the first step will be to you know, install Docker. So let me, and, and then uh, I'm taking you know, super user uh, access. So that's the sudo you know, minus S that, that I'm doing. Now, so today uh, let me look at the repository. So I'm gonna be using this particular repository that I've already uh, cloned, right? So let me go inside this particular repo and I will show you this repository as is, as I've created. And this is the repo that I'm gonna be releasing today. So here you see, I have two object detection, um, you know, object detection apps that uh, I'm showing how to build, right? So there's faster RCNN, and then there is mass RCNN. And again, both of them you can actually use for any application. So they have not been pre-trained for any specific application. So if you wanna use them for medical imaging, you actually can, right? So uh, if there is a you know, particular region of interest you're, you're trying to look at, absolutely you can uh, try mass RCNN. So today that's what I'm going to be building is the mask RCNN app, right? And I'll be exposing it so that you guys can play with it just because you're here, okay? All right, so let's see. Uh, I am gonna go into the mask RCNN. Oh. All right, and if you see, there is this Docker file, right? So that is a Docker file that now I am going to be building. So let's quickly look at the Docker file because that's the step we saw today. Um, so this is the Docker file, and it is calling that application mask uh, app underscore mask. So you see, again, uh, I'm initially starting by saying that the environment is going to be Python 3.7. And all of the run commands, that is all of the, all of the things that I require in order to run my application, I'm, I'm putting all of them in this run commands, right? And finally, this is the app underscore mask one dot py. Um, that is what uh, you know, I'm going to be exposing. The, the port is at 8080, and this is the finally the, the run command uh, that, that I'm you know, sending to, my, uh, to, to the uh, Docker container. So let's just uh, start building. So in this case, I already have the Docker file. So my command is docker build minus t, and let's give it a name. I, let's call it mask, mask r, and I, I also need to give it a tag. So that's the version one and then dot. So this is the uh, code, this is the command. 
uh, that is required. And then I just let it run. You have to always make sure that whenever the last part is dot, that means the Docker file is contained within that particular uh, uh, location. And uh, that's what it is doing. Uh, it, this requires GPU access. So the, the code that, that I'm, I'm using, it's actually using the, the TensorFlow Hub. So all of the models from TensorFlow Hub. So if you would like me to cover the models from TensorFlow Hub in a separate video, do let me know and uh, I'll be glad to do that. But that's a whole uh, genre in itself. So I'm, I'm not getting into that today. So this is gonna take some time to run. While this happens, I wanted to show you um, the other uh, application that I've I'd already built. So I can just literally SSH to another window. So the same virtual machine, I'm just creating another window, right? So the previous one is just, because it takes time, uh, if, especially if you have uh, things that require GPU, it's gonna take time. So what I wanted to show you is uh, how these two applications actually look like. Um, so first of all, I've already built another application which is the faster RCNN version. Now, let's say that I've already built my images. How would I check? So the command for that is called doc Docker images. So now you see this, this, this already, uh, this exists, this uh, Docker image called faster RCNN. Let's run that and let's see uh, if you guys can experience that, right? So the command for that is going to be Docker run minus minus RM minus P, which is gonna expose the node port 8080. And the name is faster RCNN version one. And as soon as it, this starts running, uh, this will tell you that uh, it's it's now ready to, to, run, to run. I'm hoping you guys have some image images that you can actually try out. So I will be telling you what is the IP address for you to use in a bit as soon as uh, this is exposed. Uh, the other thing that as soon as you do the Docker images, you will see that the size also comes up. So you see uh, these, you know, mass RCNNs and this, you know, faster RCNN. These are actually pretty heavy. So these are like 4.6 gigabytes in size. Okay, so uh, the node port has been extracted. So the HTTP link, I would, I, I would like you guys to, to try out now. It's actually not HTTPS. So you'll have to go to HTTP and 8080. So I just, uh, you know, upload my image. And then I just wait for the outcome. And while this outcome is happening, I can literally see what is happening in the background. So uh, it's already given me the outcomes. So you see, this is the outcome. And uh, so here is the original image. Each and every one of the cards are now uh, in, in red in the in down boxes. The bus has its own. And people, you, although these, these people are really hard to see, but the, the system was able to detect them, right? So, uh, and the width of the bounding boxes tells you how confident it is. So it's a, it's a very you know, broad bounding box. That means it is uh, detecting the, the, the right one. It's a high probability. And if it's a very thin one, it's, the probability is pretty on the lower side, right? So this is how you know your typical object detection algorithm would work. Uh, this is going to take a little longer, but yeah. So this code is all uh, available to you. Um, the application, as well as you know how you expose this uh, to your uh, to your uh, you know, customers. So please feel free to you know work with them to you know try them out on your own. So here, here you go. So you have finally the the, the nighttime images, and if you see the the regions of interest are now much more uh, accurate. And you, here you see you, have, you literally have the bounding boxes and the regions around the car, traffic light, people. So this is a much more accurate version of whatever you had, but it is definitely slower. 